Thank you everyone for joining. Good evening. <clears throat> Welcome to uh, PwC budget 2022. As you know, this was the first budget presented by Honorable uh, Basil Rajapaksa after assuming duties as, uh, as the finance minister, uh, a budget presented under, uh, may I say, a difficult sort of environment, difficult conditions, uh, <clears throat> factors affecting uh, us from, uh, uh, from the pandemic as well as still recovering from uh, some of the events that took place uh, a few years ago. So uh, let me also welcome uh, one of our panelists, Mr. Dilanka Jinadasa, Chief Executive Managing Director of uh, Hela Clothing. I also have uh, Shamin Tilakaratna, uh, Head of Tax at PwC, and also <coughs> Rubini Fernando, from my uh, director from my advisory team. Shamin, you want to kick off uh, with the analysis? Over to you. Thank you, Sujiva. Let me just share my screen. Uh, Sujiva, can you see my screen? We can see you and we can hear you well, Shaman. Good okay. to go. Okay. So, as you rightly mentioned, uh, Sujiva, this was uh, the Honorable Finance Minister's maiden budget. And going into this budget, there was a lot of expectation. There was also a, a lot of apprehension. Um, on the one hand, uh, we have the public and uh, most of the public uh, expecting something extraordinary out of this budget. And on the other hand, we had uh, the taxpayers wondering whether the government would uh, stick to its promise it made last year of uh, maintaining consistency with the tax policy and not, you know, uh, uh, moving around the taxes too much. There was a lot of speculation as to whether the VAT thresholds would be brought down, the corporate tax rates would be increased, personal tax labs would be increased. Uh, so there was a lot of uh, discussion going into this budget and uh, uh, as I take you through uh, some of the proposals, uh, you'd see that uh, from a tax side, the tax fiscal proposals, there aren't really uh, very many uh, and to that extent, uh, the government has kept its promise of maintaining consistency. Uh, on the other hand, uh, when you compare it with... Um, the promise of not uh, increasing taxes, well, there, there is a little bit of a question mark because there are certain revenue generating measures that have been introduced, but mostly on uh, the corporate sector. Uh, and there are two on the, uh, the higher end corporates. So let's take a look at uh, what those changes are as we go along. So just to give uh, uh, a brief introduction to uh, the whole speech, uh, that was delivered today by the Honorable Finance Minister. Uh, as he rightly said, uh, we are in challenging times and his theme of this budget was also challenging the challengers, uh, trying to overcome uh, what has transpired over these last couple of years with the pandemic and so on. So mainly his uh, speech and the proposals were concentrated on presenting certain proposals or policies uh, to be implemented in the future and the policies that were brought out were uh, very wide and varying it uh, uh, covered a, a vast area of topics but just to uh, give a brief overview it generally concentrated mostly on uh, transitioning sri lanka from a trading to a manufacturing economy uh, and to thereby generate more uh, revenue to the government so from a trading to a manufacturing economy and to, un, and to achieve this, there were other policies and proposals that were introduced such as uh, import substitution, uh, value addition exports um, uh, and, and, and also green, uh, uh, green manufacturing. So the, the main uh, theme was from transitioning to a trading to a manufacturing economy. Then they've also mentioned about uh, this hub concept. Again, this hub concept has been a topic that has been discussed 
over many budgets and over many years. Uh, some of it is already implemented through the hub regulations under the Finance Act. So here again, we see a policy of a, a hub concept, which is a little bit more wider than what has been given under the Finance Act. And we'll come to that. Uh, again, these are only policies and the specifics are yet to be determined and how they are to be implemented are to be seen. Then there's an emphasis on exports. And when I say exports, I mean value added exports and import substitution. So we can uh, discuss this also as we uh, take up the panel discussion. And of course, an emphasis on digitalization, uh, moving our country and our economy and our whole system basically uh, to a digitalized platform. And there are certain uh, amendments and certain uh, proposals that uh, surround this as well. So that's basically an overall uh, from a policy angle. So we move on to the tax uh, proposals, which is what everyone is actually eagerly waiting for. And uh, this is uh, one of the largest revenue generating uh, taxes uh, that uh, the government has proposed. And uh, it's called a surcharge tax. Now, uh, this surcharge, it's called a surcharge tax. That's what it has been described as. This tax, uh, if you take a look at it, is, is similar to the super gains tax we had uh, some time back, which was introduced via the 2015 Finance Act, and it was applicable uh, on the for the year of assessment 13-14. Now, the super gains tax also, just like the surcharge tax, is to be a one-off tax, right? And it is to be uh, essentially on those earning super gain profits. So if I just give you a comparison of uh, the super gains tax versus the surcharge tax, so the super gains tax was, as I said, implemented uh, uh, in 2015, and it was payable, the tax was a 25% tax, payable based on the profit of the year of assessment 13-14. So the chargeable people were any company or individual uh, that had a profit before tax of more than $2 billion. or if you were a group of companies and the aggregate uh, profit of the group of companies exceeded $2 billion, then you had to pay this. Uh, super gains tax, which was also 25% of taxable income. So uh, a company would have to pay it individually, a company or an individual would have to pay it individually if your uh, entity profit was more than uh, 2 billion, or if as a group, as a whole, you exceeded 2 billion uh, profit before tax for the year of assessment 13 14, then each entity in the group had to pay the tax of 25% on the taxable income. Now, what we know of surcharge tax so far is that it is to be implemented in the year of assessment 2021. Uh, it's silent as to whether uh, the, the, the base is also again, um, uh, 25, the tax base is 25% of taxable income. It's not very clear whether the 2 billion is in reference to the taxable income or will it be in reference to profit before tax. In the super gains tax, it was uh, the chargeable threshold was set in terms of profit before tax as per your audited statements. Here, it just mentions that if you have a taxable income of two thousand of two billion, you you have to pay a tax of twenty five percent. So, taxable income is a little bit of a volatile thing because that is after making your tax adjustments, and that's something that someone can play around with. So, perhaps after this presentation, the finance ministry might. Uh, uh, give us more clarity on this and make it uh, profit before tax rather than taxable income. But the tax tax would be calculated on your taxable income threshold to be on the profit before tax. Uh, it has been mentioned that it will be implemented in the year of assessment 2021. So uh, it's presumably on the profit of 2021. Or again, they may come back later on with a clarification that it is based on the previous year's profit. Uh, the 2021 return is to be filed 30th November, so um, there is still room to play around with this. And the super games tax was uh, introduced in three equal installments and specific dates were given. So uh, we'll have to wait on clarification what exactly the dates will be uh, and uh, uh, how soon it's going to be implemented. So the expected revenue from this surcharge tax is $100 billion. Uh, and uh, Honorable Finance Minister in his speech mentioned that there are 62 entities that would end up paying this tax 
as of their calculation. Right. The next tax that was mentioned was the special GST. Now this tax is not actually a new proposal that was brought in uh, fresh in this budget. Uh, and normal uh, finance minister did mention that uh, yeah, this is the, the same proposal that was introduced uh, in last year's budget, uh, and which was not implemented and they proposed to implement it. So we don't have any other new information or any new clarification surrounding this tax uh, other than uh, what was given to us at the uh, last times budget uh, speech. Uh, according to the specifications given in last time speech, so the GST is a goods and services tax which was going to be applicable on these five industries, alcohol, cigarettes, telecommunication, betting and gaming and vehicles. Uh, and at that time, uh, the concept was that in place of all these other indirect taxes these industries play, for example, alcohol, you have customs duty, special excise duty, cigarettes, you have customs duty, special excise duty, VAT. So in, addition, in, in lieu of all these numerous taxes that these industries pay, the proposal was to introduce one tax called the GST, goods and service tax, to be implemented by one uh, authority not necessarily the Inland Revenue Department, by one authority, it could be a new authority. Uh, no one knows as to why this was no, really not implemented uh, uh, last year, maybe because there was a, a lot of uh, uh, negative feedback on this tax, but now it's been, uh, they have confirmed that it will be implemented uh, effective uh, next year. And the expected revenue from this is 50 billion. Now, again, at the last time's budget, it was a specifically mentioned that the idea of GST is not to be a new revenue generating tax, but rather to uh, administer these taxes that are already there effectively uh, in a more effective manner. So it was not aimed at uh, increasing revenue or generating additional revenue. However, this time's uh, technical notes, uh, they have mentioned that the expected revenue of 50 billion, we'll have to wait and see uh, how the scheme is going to be implemented. It's going to be a fairly uh, compli complicated calculation to amalgamate all these taxes because these taxes are have different tax bases uh, and uh, to ensure that both the government doesn't lose revenue and hopefully doesn't add a additional burden so it's going to be a complicated formula uh, we'll have to wait and see what that formula will be uh, they mentioned specifically it's 50 billion is expected on this we're not sure whether it's in addition or whether uh, it is in lieu of these taxes now Again, why there is a little bit of doubt is because as I move along, I'll uh, explain there is uh, uh, excise duty on cigarettes has been increased. So why at this stage to uh, increase the excise duty if you are going to replace it with a consolidated tax? So this could be a, maybe a new tax, we don't know. Then we move on to VAT on financial services. As I mentioned, these taxes are all aimed at uh, uh, the high-end corporates, those earning higher profits. So VAT on financial services is on the banking sector uh, and the financial sector. The currently, they pay uh, VAT on financial services at 15%. Uh, it's on uh, value addition, payable on value addition on supply of financial services. Now they propose to increase it to 18%. It was specifically mentioned that this should not be passed on to the customer. That was mentioned. Um, they expect to collect 14 billion from this uh, increase and it is to be implemented effective January to December 2022. This is not 20, sorry, this is 2022. And it's to be payable monthly. Um, we'll have to wait and see whether this is going to be a continuous uh, increase or whether it is only for the financial year uh, 2022 that remains to be seen uh, super gains tax or the surcharge tax of course they have specifically mentioned it's a one-off tax and it won't be uh, recurring then there are a few other taxes uh, that have been uh, other miscellaneous taxes uh, that have been in both introduced and increased on cigarettes, as I mentioned, excise duty has been increased so that a price of a cigarette will increase by 5 rupees with immediate effect. It will be gazetted tonight, probably effective midnight. Expected revenue is 8 billion. I think in anticipation of this increase, 
uh, there was a shortage in the in, of cigarettes in the market uh, uh, over the last few days. So obviously this was an expected uh, revenue generating proposal. Excise duty on liquor is also to be increased with immediate effect. We'll have to wait and see what that increase is. Uh, it'll be gazetted at midnight. Uh, there's also some miscellaneous levies uh, that have been introduced in the, to the motor vehicle industry. Uh, levies such as the accident levy, which is reimbursable from your insurance fee. Then uh, a fee for uh, modernization or modification of your vehicles and upgrading of vehicles. Uh, there are certain fees that are going to propose to be levied. And from that, the expected revenue is to be 4 billion rupees. There is also uh, a proposal to release seized vehicles that are with the customs at the moment, to release these vehicles upon the payment of taxes. And uh, uh, these together with other uh, uh, license fees I expect to uh, generate a revenue of 25 billion. There are a few uh, proposals with respect to tax administration as well. Um, mostly to again um, improve the efficiency of tax administration. So we have the large taxpayer unit and the upper corporate tax unit of the Indian Revenue Department is to be further strengthened because as mentioned by the Honorable Finance Minister, 80% of the taxes come from these two units, uh, which is the large taxpayer units. So they are to be strengthened further to uh, increase revenue generation from the large taxpayers. Uh, then the digital platform for the revenue agencies that uh, proposed to, there are certain um, deficiencies, uh, certain uh, challenges or blocks that need to be addressed. And uh, these will be addressed uh, with the platform upgrades and so on. There will be a single window at Sri Lanka Customs uh, to address again certain uh, deficiencies that are currently there. Then there will be a digital revenue new platform at excise department its uh, implementation is to be expedited and uh, submission of digital invoices and documents uh, via, uh, via e-filing are to be accepted as valid documents and that's to be facilitated these are not i'm just moving on now uh, moving on so those are the tax proposals and i'm moving on uh, from the tax proposals or uh, fiscal proposals to the non-fiscal proposals uh, as I mentioned, uh, there were very few tax proposals and they were mostly centered around uh, generating revenue and aimed at the high-end taxpayers. So these are the uh, non-fiscal uh, measures that are introduced. And mostly, as I mentioned, uh, we are concentrating on moving from a trading to a manufacturing economy. And to that, exp uh, uh, to that extent, uh, there are some reforms that have been introduced on the import-export procedure. Uh, one is to update the existing HS coding system, then also to introduce a single window system to make import export, uh, export process uh, more easier and integrated uh, with other institutions that uh, work with the Sri Lanka customs. Then they will introduce a grading system uh, for the exporters, which will uh, facilitate certain concessions to the exporters who, are, who have a high grading and will encourage them. Uh, to you know increase their standards and also we have uh, customs duty and cess at the moment we have a three-tiered customs duty system uh, 0 15 and 30 so customs duty and cess are to be simplified we have to wait and see what that is what that simplification exactly is uh, these simpli the cess simplification and the customs duty simplification will not apply of course to uh, HS codes on the liquor, cigarettes, motor vehicles and domestic product produced agricultural products but for the others, other products with the other uh, other HS codes there's going to be a simplification of rate. What exactly that is we'll have to wait and see. And there will be of course a simplified licensing mechanism uh, because as it was mentioned by the Honorable Finance Minister there are several levies payable at several institutions. They propose to now integrate that and make it uh, one simplified system. Then there is this development of hub. Uh, it's a concept, the concept that they have put forward. Uh, at the moment, we already have uh, what we call commercial hub under the Finance Act. And the commercial hub regulations is mostly centered around uh, on-report trading, 
offshore uh, uh, trading, uh, free port manufacturing, things like that. But this uh, concept of uh, the hub has been extended further and there are several sub uh, elements to it. Uh, one is uh, this naval hub where they propose to develop the Colombo port as an entry port hub, uh, Trincomalee port as an industrial port, the Gaul port as a tourist port and the Hamantata port as a service port. Then the new finance act is to establish free ports, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the Colombo under the Colombo hub regulations. Colombo and Hamantata port are already considered free ports. Uh, they also propose to simplify rules with regard to registration of ships. And then we have what we call the aviation hub, that is to make Sri Lanka the preferred uh, stopover location. Uh, um, and to that extent, they propose to improve infrastructure to facilitate this. Uh, then the energy hub is the, uh, a proposal to utilize the Trincomalee tank farm for bunkering activities and then also to use our renewable energy uh, uh, generating capacity to export green hydrogen from the surplus of renewable energy. So these are all policies and things that are yet to be implemented uh, are mainly concepts and have to be developed further. Then again, commercial hub and this commercial hub uh, is different to the commercial hub regulations that is there under the Finance Act. It's, it it uh, has two parts to it. One is to consider to uh, encourage uh, the hubs, uh, the ports as trading of goods and then also uh, to have facilitate a hub of uh, professional services. That's where uh, you will have the banking and insurance sectors uh, having, say, arbitration centers and all set up here in uh, Sri Lanka. But again, there that is, uh, it's still a concept and there's a lot to do to achieve that status, especially to, in to achieve an international arbitration status here in Sri Lanka. Uh, a lot of know-how and a lot of uh, laws and regulations would have to be go into it before that can be actually implemented. Then we have also uh, the Knowledge Hub, where uh, they propose there are several proposals. So one is one would be to amend the laws to facilitate uh, uh, free foreign currency inflows for young uh, freelancers who are providing IT solutions. So this is basically, I think, uh, although it was not specifically mentioned, I think this refers to mostly these payment gateways, the facilitation of PayPal and so on to enable uh, freelancers, uh, free young freelancers to provide services out of Sri Lanka to uh, those outside. But there are, again, there are other challenges uh, that need to be sorted out before PayPal can actually come here. Then, you know, they propose also to introduce uh, to smart banking units and to completely digitalize the banking sector and to that extent, uh, blockchain technology to be introduced. Uh, and a framework to be introduced there. So there's a lot of work that needs to go in there also in implementing that framework and formulating it. Uh, special finance bill to simplify and safeguard foreign currency transaction. Then to encourage the establishment of uh, international schools here in Sri Lanka and hospitals in every district. So there will be tax concessions given uh, to that extent to these international schools and hospitals. What they are exactly have not been spelled out. So we'll have to wait and see what it is. Uh, then obtain green bond financing facilities to respond to climate change. And of course, for the IT and BPO sector, they propose to implement three new techno parks. I believe two have already commenced. Uh, then they propose to introduce three new tech, techno parks. So that, in a broad sense, uh, are the tax, the fiscal and the non-fiscal proposals. Uh, I think we could move on to the panel discussion and maybe clarify more doubts and discuss more points at the discussion. Uh, thank you, Shamin. And also, uh, let me uh, thank you for that high level uh, overview uh, on some of the contents uh, from the budget speech. Uh, let me also welcome uh, Governor of the Central Bank uh, and a close friend of the firm, uh, Strajit Timad Kabral, and also uh, Dr. Vijay Vardhana, former uh, deputy governor, economist, and, uh, and, a, and a writer. Uh, a warm welcome to uh, both of you. Uh, governor, can you hear me? So maybe we just wait on uh, for a while. Uh, Dr. Vijayawadana, if I may uh, start off with you. Uh, 
Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jurani, in a, in a nutshell, your sort of, what's your, what's your take uh, on, on today's uh, uh, sort of budget speech, maiden budget, budget speech by uh, Honorable Basil Rajapaksa? And, and under trying conditions, difficult uh, environment. Exactly. Uh, so Do you think he has ticked all the boxes? Yeah, he has actually done a very, uh, you know, difficult task, accomplished a difficult task because, uh, in fact, he, he himself is not responsible for the current economic uh, crisis in Sri Lanka. It's a crisis which had been with us for some time. Uh, he has become the Minister of Finance and now he has to shoulder the entire burden now. Uh, given the present state of the economy in Sri Lanka and the deteriorating economic conditions, in my view, uh, I think Ms. Minister Basil Rajapaksa has tried to address some of the issues that we are having, but not all the issues. So as a result, uh, it should be a continuous process. Uh, he has, you know, tried to address some of the issues this year in 2022, but uh, once uh, he has accomplished his task in 2022, it is necessary for Sri Lanka to uh, address all the current economic issues because uh, there's a misunderstanding here. Many people in Sri Lanka believe that it's the job of the central bank to uh, bring about economic growth in the country, but central bank job is simply to uh, uh, bring about the stability in the prices and stability in the exchange rate, nothing else. The economic growth should come from the attempts made by the government. For that purpose, uh, there has been a large number of uh, proposals made by the Minister of Finance. And uh, all these proposals involve uh, additional expenditure to be incurred by the government. For that purpose, you have to earn revenue as well. So it's a matter of uh, whether Minister Basil Rajbax would be able to uh, generate the necessary revenue flow quick enough to uh, incur the expenditure program that he has uh, undertaken in the budget for 2022. In my view, uh, it is just like a house on fire and he has tried to extinguish the fire by just, you know, sprinkling some water there. So once the fire has been extinguished, it is uh, all of us to get together and uh, take the economy forward uh, through a very uh, complete economic program because uh, in his budget speech, he has never, he, he didn't mention anything about going to IMF. He didn't mention anything about, you know, releasing the exchange rate at the 203 rupee uh, per US dollar today. Uh, removal of the uh, exchange control and import control, there was no mention in the budget. Uh, but some of the things that he has mentioned in the budget, it had given us the indication that he is a market friendly person and as a result, uh, he is willing to embrace the market principles in order to bring about this uh, uh, the long term uh, uh, long term solution to sri lanka's main economic problems thank you thank you dr vijayadana uh, dilanka uh, a quick one to you uh, as you know there is so much emphasis on on uh, on exports and uh, and, and uh, I mean, personally, congratulations to you under your leadership. Uh, Hela Clothing has gone, I mean, ha has done wonders over the last couple of years. Uh, I mean, uh, a lot of credit to you. And uh, you will be the first apparel company, uh, the, tr the true sort of to uh, list on the Columbus Stock Exchange over the next couple of years, sorry, over the next couple of weeks. How do you see, uh, how is your order book over the next uh, sort of few quarters and uh, where do you see the industry in, in the short to medium term, Dilan? Thanks, Ajiva. Um, I mean, given the level of volatility Sri Lanka experience, and um, even from a global standpoint, uh, there's a lot of optimism. Um, as you would have seen in the last few months, export numbers have been quite healthy. Year on year, there is growth, even especially from a apparel standpoint. And for the foreseeable future, there is no reason to believe that this will die down. I think what's important to understand is to see for how long this momentum will continue and how do we continue to give confidence to global brands on that Sri Lanka is a safe place to uh, do business with. So I think it was it was very promising uh, to see from a policy standpoint, re-emphasis on the hub concept. 
uh, that's something which the apparel in industry has been advocating for a while because you know we've always said whilst the apparel industry is just a five billion dollar industry compared to 35 in Bangladesh and more than 35 in Vietnam GD, I mean exports per GD, uh, per, per capita is quite high when it comes to Sri Lanka so Sri Lanka will always struggle to you know surpass the eight ten billion dollar mark but through the hub concept it will enable us to tap into the resources and the labor pools be it in the Indian subcontinent or in other continents like Africa or in the Far East and really do the value addition from here and export our expertise using the labor pools of other countries so it was it was very nice to see the policy framework addressing the some of the shortcomings uh, of the hub concept um, and the fact that uh, the government has realized that we need to transition from being a trading economy to a manufacturing economy um, you know we need to at the end of the day we do need to export more so uh, any policy framework that will help enable that it, it will always be welcome by the industry thank you uh... Uh, thank you, Sanjay, uh, for joining. Uh, we have Sanjay Mohtala, chairman of uh, Board of Investment, uh, someone from the private sector who's really taken uh, BOI sort of to the next level. And uh, he being a consultant himself over the years, uh, he really understands what needs to be done. Sanjay, your initial thoughts uh, on uh, how you see uh, sort of the FDI flows to uh, uh, investment into the country over the over the short to medium term? Well, I think Sujiva, like, uh, meaning if you ask my thoughts on the budget, I think it's overall, there are a couple of good streaks um, um, and I think really necessary steps that has taken, uh, taken right? Um, meaning the idea is not just to reduce the uh, the money that you, or the amount that you charge or the fees that you charge and you charge only one fees from entry point for um, company registration, but also making sure the information is captured in one location and transmitted. Now, stock exchanges does that, BOI does that to some extent, but getting national attention is a good thing to do that, right? And then I think the problems always have is that, you know, you have a tax regime on one side and a BOI set of rules and these don't necessarily match. We try to do everything we can within the, the rule, rule book, uh, try to play and help the investors. So I think having holistic revision of this I think it's much needed and I think something that uh, we've been lobbying for, so which is greatly uh, encouraged to see. Then I think there always has been about two critical things, right? If you may, I think many a times I've talked about, if you want to double the GDP, you want to take, take the thrust sectors and you want to really think about how you holistically enable them. So two things, what matters? Everyone talks about this one-stop shop. The only way that you can do a proper one-stop shop is by having a predefined, pre-qualified, pre-cleared uh, economic zones. So I think the emphasis on economic zones to develop so much, I think is the first uh, in the history of say, in, 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 this, in this country because 2000, 2014, I think of 18 has been only one zone and then two zones we've developed last two years with greater difficulties during the COVID. Now the COVID's uh, behind us, hopefully. So we need to put the emphasis. So that's another good aspect of it. And um, just as Prof mentioned, I think in terms of the, the to show that the market friendliness, whether it is the the change of the Finance Act and a few other things. There are good progressive things that happen to, to, to improve the ease of doing business, uh, show the industries or show the investors, look, we are taking these steps, we are making things easier for you to come and set up and do business. Well, your FDA is welcome. Uh, hub concept is one of the things. Uh, and really thinking and putting Sri Lanka as the center of Asia and really thinking through that. But the important thing is, and the elephant in the room is, all this depends on macroeconomic stability. And I think that is where the fundamental is, Ajiva, that I'm struggling uh, and many of the investors are struggling uh, in terms of uh, whether it is the liquidation laws uh, or whether it is the other aspects that you bring in. You need to bring that to uh, bring in confidence, uh, meaning uh, the, the, the macroeconomic stability. I'm sure Ms., uh, uh, the Governor Cabral would have also articulated that. And I think some uh, some articulation that uh, on the uh, on the budget would have put the icing on the cake because uh, there's concerted efforts to keep the policy consistent to some extent because look I think it was a drastic tax cut that was given in the beginning of the year. Uh, my humble opinion is that the way that you uh, incentivize and stimulate the economy at two thousand dollars per GDP is quite different to four thousand dollars per GDP, and I think the uh, 
uh, if I had a clean sheet, I would have done the tax cut much differently. But I think within that frame, uh, because that's all about under the bridge and after a lot of queues, um, uh, you know, a QE from many countries. So we had a similar position regardless where we started. Now, I think the important thing is we need to pull back at a certain extent, but I think the pullback has to come in without really hindering the economy, but also we can't continue to maintain uh, such a huge budget gap, uh, what we had. Um, so we need to be pulled back and I think certain measures have been put in place. Uh, whether some of these measures will yield the same, same amount of liquidity that is anticipated is yet to be seen because I think we had NPT and few other things, which perhaps only yielded about 100 billion. I think the important thing is we achieve that quantum, otherwise you'll end up with another huge budget deficit, uh, putting a lot of F, uh, stress on the uh, the macro in terms of the, uh, sorry, the, on the treasury, either getting the bank to print more money and drive inflation and manage that uh, in terms of TBs or to be able to have additional finance coming in. So I think overall, I look at it and say a lot of progressive things have happened, at least put into the national level, uh, what, we, what we've been fighting for and pushing in terms of doing ease of doing business and the sectors that we want to push in and making sure that we have a structured approach in terms of getting those things because BOI is one organization, you can't do everything. And having that at the national level helps uh, drastically the effort that we put in. But I think the, the, the clarity that needs to come in for the, all the aspects that uh, the central banks uh, really working towards providing. And I think on the from the treasury side coming that in terms of roadmap I would say uh, puts this budget, I would say, uh, apart from few others that I've seen in the recent past. So in a difficult time, but I think it's uh, much more, much welcome and much thought through. Uh, we, everyone thought that we had to might have tightened our belts a lot, but we still might have to. But I think overall, positively, I take it uh, in terms of investment point of view, investment in, in terms of uh, getting the FDIs and uh, getting the companies to come and invest in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ruini, you want to take on some questions? With, uh, 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 sorry, sorry uh, Ruini, before you uh, answer, you, uh, before you move on, would it be okay if I take some of the questions that have been posted on the chat box? Sure, sure, Shamin. Go ahead. Uh, actually, I missed out uh, explaining one other new tax that was has been introduced, uh, and that is the uh, social security contribution tax, uh, which is effectively a sort of a COVID tax, and uh, there are the tax bases. Uh, 3% on turnover where uh, any person has a turnover from business of more than 120 million, there's a tax of 3%, similar to uh, the nation's building tax we had previously, uh, which was 2%. This is 3% on a turnover of more than 120 million. And the effective date of this tax is to be 1st April 2022. And I can see some questions being asked whether this tax um, is a deductible and so on. So th that has not been specified, whether it's prescribed tax, whether you can deduct it for income tax or not, uh, has not been yet uh, uh, explained. We'll have to wait and see what that is. Uh, there's also a, a little confusion uh, with regard to the rate because the speech, the body of the speech uh, refers to the tax as 2.5%, but the technical notes uh, refer to is at 3% and I think it will be 3% generally the technical notes are what we take uh, uh, for analysis so uh, uh, it probably be 3% on your turnover of more than 120 million. There's also a question on the surcharge tax whether it will be on individual companies yes the criteria is if you have a uh, taxable income of more than 2, million, 2 billion whether it's taxable income or profit before tax we'll have to wait and see again but it is yes on individual companies if you reach that threshold as well and irrespective of whether you are earning in foreign currency export or not uh, as long as you are a tax resident of Sri Lanka it would I would say it would apply to you okay Ruini. thank you Ruini, Ruini all yours Thank you, Sujiva. Thanks, Shamin. Uh, Dr. Vijayavardhana, uh, on, on the budget deficit, I think the numbers indicate uh, that the deficit will be 8.8% of GDP. It's projected to be. A large part of this is actually uh, getting financed by uh, domestic borrowings. So it will be uh, financed through the domestic uh, financial system. Dr. Vijayavadana, what are the what is the implication of that? Does that mean that with government borrowing increasing, can interest rates go up? Uh, will there be less capacity for investment by the private sector? What are your thoughts on the financing of the budget deficit? Well, uh, first of all, we need, uh, the numbers about the revenue of the government, 
they all anticipated numbers and we don't know right now whether the government will be able to generate that revenue flow because uh, most of the taxes that are to be uh, introduced uh, they take time uh, for the for the taxpayers to make the payment number one number two for the collection departments to collect them so we will have to wait until the end of the year to see whether the government has been able to generate this level of tax revenue then the budget deficit actually will depend on the government's ability to generate that tax revenue and also keep the expenditure at the level uh, which the budget has uh, forecasted it and uh, based on that they have this 8.8 percent and that number is a questionable number and um, since the government is unable to make any foreign borrowings at this point of time uh, because of the uh, government's credit ratings have been uh, downgraded around C double A level or CCC level, uh, we, if we are to go to uh, foreign markets to raise this money, we have to pay a very high uh, yield rate in order to generate that. So basically, the entirety of this 3.2 billion which the government is planning to borrow, uh, part of that will be a recycling amount, about 1.5 billion is recycling, new, new borrowing is about 1.7 billion. Uh, that will have an impact on the domestic fin financial market definitely and unless the government is in a position to increase the rates of interest uh, it is not easy for the public debt department to raise that money from the domestic sources so already we have seen that governor Cabral had allowed the interest rates to go up to a certain level but in the last uh, auction we found that the interest rate had been again suppressed and they had come down from the previous week's level so if you cannot uh, have both now, if you are to control the interest rates and try to generate that money uh, from the market, it will be difficult. Number two is that uh, definitely there will be this crowding out effect because when the government borrows, the private sector will be giving just about one to that. So it will have the growth impact on the growth also because we all know that the uh, about say 82, 82% of the local uh, GDP comes from the private sector's operation. So if you are trying to stunt the operation of the private sector, we will have a problem. So these are critical challenges faced by the central bank as well as the Ministry of Finance and they, there is a necessity for them to balance these uh, conflicting objectives. I hope they will do it. So I think that will be one of the key challenges. I agree, Dr. Vijayavadana. One more question to you um, on the... On the uh, raising of capital, uh, there was a reference to uh, getting in longer term, more sort of uh, efficient capital uh, to, to shore up our reserves. Uh, green financing was mentioned. And right now we are depending on more short term instruments like swaps uh, and uh, so on. What is your view on what is a sustainable way of managing our debt into the medium and long term? What, what steps uh, would we need to take as a country and as a former policymaker, how do you see it? As it is the only source for Sri Lanka to raise this long-term capital to increase the reserve, foreign reserves of the country is to go for the commercial market and issue ISBs. That part is out because the uh, ISBs are presently traded at a huge discount and the yield rates have gone up even after the uh, presentation with the uh, the six-month uh, roadmap by Governor Cabral, uh, the yield rates had uh, immediately shot up. They had immediately shot up and they remained stubbornly at this high rate. So raising long-term funds from the commercial markets is out. Then there is no any other way for Sri Lanka to generate that amount of uh, money because the uh, at present, many people don't understand that the central bank's net foreign assets have been negative now for two months consecutively. And the negative position is on the increase because in, in August it was 400 million uh, US dollars. Now it is 790 million US dollars at the end of September. According to the tentative calculations, in the, at the end of uh, October it will be around 1.3 billion and it is on the increase. So given this scenario where the uh, gross resources are falling, uh, central bank foreign liabilities are at a very high level, Unless we are able to bring in about say 7 to 8 billion long term funds, we will not be able to uh, build up the reserves to a sustainable level. 
Uh, this is again something which Governor Kabdal we have to keep uh, take into very you know serious consideration. So this is why we have been advising Governor Kabdal, Minister Basil Rajapaksa, and the government people that we, they have to immediately go to IMF and get the facility from IMF so that they can build up the uh, uh, confidence of the foreign investors in Sri Lanka and uh, they will be able to build up the uh, reserve base on a long-term sustainable basis. So without going to IMF, just trying to get it from these you know, soft facilities from this country or that country and bilateral uh, borrowings from this country or that country will not help uh, Minister Basil Rajapaksa to build up the reserves on a sustainable basis. So this is one of the challenges which Dr. Kabralia will take now. Thank you, Dr. Vijayavadana. Uh, Dilanka, coming to you uh, as uh, a company which has invested uh, overseas, uh, there were a lot of uh, measures in this present budget to, to encourage uh, exports, uh, to, to incentivize exporters and uh, promote exports. Uh, how do you see, uh, you know, vis-a-vis -vis the other countries where you have been uh, doing business in and Sri Lanka, how do you see these benefits uh, as compared to other countries? And uh, where does it place us? Where does it place Sri Lanka on, on uh, in terms of competitiveness? Right. Um, so, I mean, especially really considering the markets that we have a presence in, each country has a different uh, tool that they use to attract foreign investment, especially in, uh, in our industry. So most of Africa, it's, it's really their duty-free agreements. So be it AGOA, which is the African Growth and Opportunities Act, which gives you access, duty-free access to the U.S., or even bilateral agreements, you know, with certain Asian countries from China to India uh, to even Canada. So duty-free agreements play a really important part in attracting uh, exporters to come and set up operations there. Then at the same time, there are certain countries uh, and uh, which uses tools such as rebates, export rebates. And those export rebates are given on the percentage of value addition that happens within that country. And I've personally, we've seen that being extremely beneficial because it completely changes your mindset as a manufacturer because all of a sudden it comes down to how do you create as much value as possible within that country so that you get the full benefit of that uh, rebate, right? Because if you take Sri Lanka, even though again, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier that there are $5 billion industry, we import nearly two billion, uh, two to two and a half billion dollars worth of raw materials uh, to uh, add value and export. So the net generation or the net export proceeds is far below, you know, uh, three billion or two billion. So we will have to explore similar tools. I'm not saying the government needs to give handouts, but we will have to compete internationally, uh, keeping in mind on what the other countries are offering to one attract. Uh, new exporters to come and set up here and and two to encourage the existing players to export more so uh, I think focus on free trade agreements uh, is definitely a must uh, for us to survive in the medium to long term uh, long term range uh, Ravini just one question to Dilanka before we get on to Sanjay Dilanka this there is so much talk now about this disruption to supply chain non-availability of boxes you know, uh, and then ships, you know, lining up outside the harbors, not being able to berth. I mean, tell us exactly from, I mean, I know, see, you operate from Colombo to Ethiopia, Kenya, you are into uh, Egypt now, and, uh, you know, I mean, you're a global player. Uh, tell us exactly the ground situation. There's so much discussion. Uh, how is it impacting you? So, I mean, the freight challenges, Sujiva, it, it's a global thing. It's, it's not restricted to just Sri Lanka. Um, and what it has resulted in is that major vessel lines are now focusing towards more lucrative routes. Uh, so that what it eventually means is that certain destinations get less frequency or, or, is, or is deprioritized when it comes to uh, vessel berthing. So what it was a learning experience even for us but what we had to kind of do is for example say if you want to ship from sri lanka to mombasa earlier you would have direct vessels from sri lanka to mombasa 
now we would have to instead ship from Sri Lanka to Jabalali and then from Jabalali over to Mombasa in a, through a feeder vessel. So again, like I said earlier, the whole landscape has changed, not just from a apparel standpoint, but from a global exports, uh, um, the world map has completely changed. So people are moving towards the consumer. People want to avoid more congested routes. They want localization of raw materials or supply chain. Um, so, and, and we as a manufacturer and eventually as a country will have to adapt to that and then see how do we build those levers or verticals that helps that country stay relevant and competitive. Uh, Ravini, uh, over to you. Thanks, Priyanka. Thanks, Sushila. Uh, Sanjay, coming back to you, uh, a lot of recent uh, uh, policy statements and the budget also mentioned that given the state of uh, the financial situation that Sri Lanka is and the status of public finance, we will have to rely more and more on non-borrowed capital flows. So part of which one of the significant um, items would be FDI. So that places your institution actually in a very, uh, you know, at the forefront of what we are going to do for Sri Lanka in the next uh, couple of years. Uh, how bad, I mean, how tough is the competition, right? Because FDI is finally a, a competition for money from for investment uh, funds, right? And there are so many very attractive destinations around us, right? How tough is the competition and how will BOI as an institution respond to this? What are some of the changes that are happening uh, within BOI to respond better? Uh, because uh, to be honest, Sanjay, I mean, our past uh, sort of numbers on FDI have not been so great when compared to our competition. So what's what's going to be different? Very interesting question, Ruini. I think uh, uh, you rightly pointed out, right? So we've been open economy since 1978. What have you to show? We have 18 billion uh, give or take because we have counted uh, 1 billion of proceeds from our home to the zone as well, I mean, uh, uh, the port twice. So 18 billion for 42 years, really we have to hold a mirror to ourselves and say what it is. And I think the the situation is also tough globally because the total uh, FDI pool has declined almost about 40%. We are around at about the 2010 numbers, but of course there is the type of FDI is still, which is attractive and needed for Sri Lanka available. But we are also moving, we are not looking for the same investment as FDI when we were doing in 90s or 2000s where we were looking at building 800 garment factories and so on and so forth. We are moving from a, a technical or high tech or high end manufacturing or high value added manufacturing and services sectors. Now, if some, I mean, if you look at the, the outline, what is outlining budget, which is very, very encouraging to see like a lot of new zones going to come in to develop certain sectors, which are, they are really needed. If you look at the the, the ten year strategy, uh, the ten year strategy that we have put down from BOI in terms of six thrust sectors, there's a, there's a full recognition of the budget and full enhancement of that, which all needed. So, but it's not just merely building a zone, right? So, if you want to get steel or if you want to get um, uh, pharmaceuticals, they could choose Sri Lanka, they could use India, they could use Bangladesh, they could use Pakistan, they could use Vietnam, Singapore. So, the option pool is rather wide. And I think we are going to increasingly fight uh, for these FDIs in the backdrop of a supply chain renormalizing or readjustment, so which gives us a little bit of a tailwind. But on the headwind, we have the macroeconomics factors and all that, and the, the companies look at, say, con concentration risks, the policy point of view. We used to have an open policy. Would you continue to have that liberal policies that uh, in terms of uh, investment flow in and out? Uh, and then the question is, have we done the basic, uh, the underlying infrastructure development to be able to get those? So that means a talent pool, that means the cost of doing business, ease of doing business, right? Have we invested into doing that? Because we need to have a green electricity because everyone's going to have a carbon component measurement when, when goods comes to Europe. And I think uh, uh, the team from Hella would really know that, right? So there's going to be a tax of 385 euros as, as, as it is now per ton. So moving for 70% renewables definitely helps. Building Aravur is a strategic thing that we started last year because we want to make it a green zone. We want to make sure the value addition is there so we can qualify for, even not if not for you, GSP Plus, because you GSP Plus, we will lose at some point, and we need to start building into those things. So I think the question is, coming back, Ruini, I'm just giving the backdrop. It is, it, 
a tooth and nail fight. And I think that when we are fighting, we, we don't have the same arsenal that India would offer with 1.3 billion people. So they can cater to the inward market and also then export whatever is left. China did the same. Vietnam did it because of the, the, either the proximity to China or whatnot. So what is our unique point of view? Our unique point of view is market access. So then it's about market access, not just the location, it's the trade agreements, which is really needed to get done. And we need to make sure that we have bilateral agreements, not if not for the entire, uh, the HS course, but at least selectively get the market access. That's very critical. Vietnam has 26 FTAs. We have a, seems to have an aftertaste on uh, when you say FTAs, but forget FTAs, at least on bilateral point of view, we need to get those agreements, right? So we need to then uh, make sure that we invest in advance to build the talent pool, the uh, the capabilities, uh, ease of doing business, the zones and all that. So which actually the budget has highlight highlighted. There's a lot about the human capital, a lot about that, so which is great. Then the third part of it is the, uh, the macro stability and the policy uh, structure in terms of policy consistency. The fourth part of it is because the fight is fierce, Right, and we are no longer the virgin on the beach, sorry for saying this, but openly we have to really engage people in their boardrooms and convince them why you should not go to Ethiopia, why you should be here versus uh, Bangladesh. And that discussion can't be a roadshow and you never would get investment that way, right? You can't do a roadshow and a nice PowerPoint presentation and really cool videos of Yala and how beautiful this place is, which is amazing. At the end of the day, they look at it and say, okay, what are the scenarios? What are my dollars and cents? On what aspects am I, as a, am I really saving money? So our capabilities to be able to go and engage them at that level and the boardrooms for a sustained engagement at the very top level is needed. And we have been a passive receiver of FDI all this time. And if you look at Invest India was a passive receiver. In 2016, they went up trying to be an active receiver. So they had a private public partnership got together, right? And then they started going and attacking, I mean, uh, engaging these companies, uh, right? Through consultants, through media agencies, through PR, right? And that is how after about almost six years, they're getting these FDIs you're getting, of course, it's a 50, uh, $1.3 billion people market. So you can't compare the 60 billion FDI you get to a 67%, uh, we are 167th of 150th of uh, India. But I think the question the coming back is it is a tough market, but we still have some of the fundamentals which we can win, right? So for a, um, for a Zeb, for a Zeba fight, we are still taking a, 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 a small knife, but we still could win the fight if we play to our strengths and if we work together and if you go after the right sectors, if you do the orchestration, keep the policy consistency and build the capabilities uh, and the underlying infra and uh, the factors uh, right. So in short, it's a tough battle, but I think there's nothing comes easy, right? So you have to fight for it. So I think we are ready to fight for it. Thanks, Anjay. Agreed. Thank I you. think it's a joint battle, right? Uh, you, like you said, it's the public-private partnership because both sides play a role. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, uh, Yes, one. Charmin, do you, uh, you want to take one or two questions which has come through from the participants? Uh, so, one yes. thing, yeah. so, so, so one thing, Charmin, uh, from what I heard uh, so far is that on the, especially the surcharge tax, which is going to be uh, on the banking sector, especially made to understand that the larger banks, uh, the impact on them could be uh, anything from about eight to 10 billion uh, for the year 2022. And for the mid-sized banks, it can be anything from about three to five billion. Uh, so the, the the so that's uh, the three uh, revenue measures which you mentioned, Shaman. So the first one is the surcharge tax. Other one is the three uh, percent social security cost, and the other is the financial services that going up from uh, fifteen to eighteen uh, percent. So the numbers are just on those three, uh, and as you know the. Honorable Finance Minister said uh, they expect to collect uh, <coughs> substantial, I mean, uh, the bulk of the revenue comes from that. So uh, that's what it is. Uh, gov we have uh, the governor joining. Governor, thank you uh, for joining. Uh, good evening. I know you have a hectic schedule uh, uh, today. Thank you very much for uh, joining, Governor. Uh, 
down on everyone's mind. Uh, uh, we have three uh, uh, three other panelists, Governor. Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. All all sort of uh, people known to you. We have Dr. Vijay Bodhana. Uh, we have uh, Sanjay Mohtala from uh, BOI and, uh, and Dilanka Jindadasa, CEO from uh, Hela Clothing. Governor, everyone wants to know from you is uh, especially the uh, the three variables uh, what's going to be on the short to medium term. Uh, maybe we lost. Uh, Governor, can you hear us? Maybe, uh, maybe we lost him. Uh, uh, Governor, uh, so the question on everyone's mind is uh, how yep. the three variables are going to behave in the short to medium yep. term, the interest, the interest rates, uh, the exchange rate and, and inflation. Uh, do you want to just share your thoughts? Sorry, I think we lost him again. Just give a minute. Uh, yes. Maybe until the uh, governor, can you hear? <laughs> governor, can you hear us? I, I can hear you very well. Right. Uh, so, governor, uh, your view, uh, sort of your views in the short to medium term. I uh, can hear you very well. The interest rates, inflation, and exchange rate would behave. Uh, your sort of expectations. Sorry, Governor, you're breaking up. Uh, Can you maybe, maybe if you. Not sure whether you need to rejoin. Uh, yes. Sorry, Governor. Sorry, Governor, you're breaking up. My phone. So, until such time, uh, Shamin, you want to uh, any other question which has come through? Uh, yes, Jeeva. So, uh, as I mentioned about the GST uh, uh, tax, which was a tax to be introduced to consolidate all the other uh, indirect taxes that are applicable on those five industries that I mentioned. Uh, and then there was this question, there was a contradiction, why then increase the excise levy on uh, cigarettes now uh, if you are going to bring the consolidated tax in the future? So I believe that the answer to that is that uh, the increase in the excise levy will probably only be applicable till January, till this consolidated or till the consolidated GST is uh, introduced and uh, implemented. So once that comes into play, uh, these other uh, miscellaneous taxes would go out. Thanks, uh, Shamin. Uh, Governor, can you hear us? I can hear you now very well. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Governor, just, just to give get you. To... A... Yes, go ahead, Governor. Yes, I think uh, your question is very valid one, where everyone wants to know where would the exchange rate be, where would the interest rates be, would be, where would the inflation be. These are very uh, important variables in any economy. Well, I can tell you, inflation it will rise somewhat, especially because of these recent increases in the uh, pricing of all, almost all commodities, uh, which which uh, together make the basket of items in which inflation is measured, that supply side shock is definitely going to be something that we will have to grapple with in, the, in, in this particular period of time. At the same time, uh, we have seen interest rates being stable in the recent three to four weeks. Uh, we saw interest rates rising. Yes, because we needed to uh, pull back on the treasury bills that had been uh, issued quite substantially. And we are pulling that back gently. As I have always been saying, it is necessary to pull that back at the right time. And now that's happening. And at the same time, we have been encouraged by the fact that the rates have also been somewhat uh, stable and on the side where it is uh, tightening up a little bit. So that's uh, good news. And we find that that is uh, if that trend continues, 
and that would be something that we would be in, encouraging for the future as well the exchange rate is a little more challenging than that uh, we have seen the flows being to some extent challenged as a result of uh, more imports coming into the system and the exporters uh, sometimes some of them being reluctant to convert their export earnings so we have had to bring in certain rules in order to ensure that there is a balance in this whole equation sometimes people must realize that it is the balance that will keep the economy stable so we are doing our best to ensure that that balance is struck and uh, i think going forward with more and more people uh, being uh, conscious of their responsibilities as well not only the legal responsibilities but also going a little beyond that in order to bring uh, the whole economy to be a lot more stable which is what everyone is striking for because unless you have a stable economy none of these things that people are talking about will be possible for us to achieve because stability is vital for any economy and that's what the central bank is attempting to do that's what the government is also ensuring that we do because unless we have that you can imagine uh, what kind of chaos there could be we got to have dollars to import uh, oil you got to have dollars to import uh, coal you got to have dollars to import gas all these are vital components of any economy so if there is one set of uh, stakeholders who believe that only their business is what is vital uh, you could find that the entire business of the country could be at stake that's why we are attempting to ensure that there is uh, uh, some stability and i believe the responses that we have received have been quite encouraging and we see that being uh, a important part of this whole exercise as you know we have already set out a road map which uh, clearly uh, states what the central bank is hoping to do and i'm glad that the government is also taking steps to uh, rationalize expenditure some of the steps that have been uh, enunciated by the uh, finance minister have been very helpful in that sense and if the government cooperates closely in ensuring that those are also delivered we would find that the whole e economy can be a lot more sustainable in going forward we are striving for a growth of at least 6% next year and that's not going to be easy that's going to be a tough uh, target but we need to strive for that in order to strive for that the fundamentals must be stable at all times keeping those stable and ensuring that we are able to deliver the uh, rest of growth will mean that sri lanka is well on its path to recovery we had a tough time in 2020 uh, with the negative growth 2021 will be reasonably uh, better satisfactory with a growth of around 5% but 2022 is what it's all about if 2022 can be a year of growth once again with port city adding on i'm glad that uh, you have been in the forefront of that uh, sujiva where you have brought in certain uh, analysis uh, which shows the potential of the port city the potential of sri lanka in delivering that if you all recognize that and work towards that uh, to ensure that this new element of gdp contribution comes from this awesome asset that has been already set up we would find that sri lanka is well on its path to recovery and with tourism also kicking in next year and we are hopeful of doing that mainly because of the vaccinations that have taken place i think sri lanka will be well on track to deal with these these uh, trio of uh, uncertainties that should then be managed much better we have the inflation uh, right now quite high but i'm sure by next year we could have it moderating we could have interest rates stabilizing at the levels that we are having now which will be very good and if we have the rupee stable and also uh, with a gentle uh, push towards appreciation that would be the kind of the uh, goldilocks arrangement not too hot not too cold just right that we can achieve and that's something that we will be all striving to do the next year as well thank you sujeeva i am afraid i might have to uh, leave you now uh, and your uh, viewers uh, i'm very grateful to you for giving me this opportunity to make these few remarks and i do hope that uh, all of you will be supportive of these ventures as well as this uh, contribution towards uh, economic development and we look forward to that uh, with uh, 
great expectation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gaon. Thank you, Gaon, for joining. I know <clears throat> you have you have a hectic schedule. I, I know your schedule uh, today as well as over the next couple of days. I know <laughs> back to back uh, engagements. So thank you very much for joining, Governor. Thank you. It has been a thank pleasure you. being. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye bye. Ruini, uh, do you want to take on uh, some of the other questions with the other panelists? Um, yes, maybe uh, we'll come back to Dr. Jawadana a little bit. Uh, Dr. Jawadana, we would like to uh, hear a little bit about uh, what was said about the, the state-owned enterprises. I think uh, over the years we have talked about uh, uh, containing the losses in SOEs and you know uh, doing reforms. Uh, this time's budget spoke about uh, the, the government support being extended only for capital expenditure and not for recurrent expenditure. Uh, overall, when you look at uh, the, the whole uh, history of state-owned enterprises, Dr. Vijayawadana, what is your uh, view. Now you find in neighboring India, uh, they have undertaken a major program of uh, SOE reform. How do you compare that with what we can do in Sri Lanka? What's the potential? What are the what is what is your view on that? Dr. Jordan, I think you're on mute. Yes. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, this is a story really, which I have heard all the time. I had been in the central bank for more than 40 years and even after my retirement from the bank now 12 years, I am hearing the story of you know reforming the state-owned enterprises and making them, converting them into profitable or viable enterprises for maybe more than now 50 years, half a century. And uh, this is uh, something which you have to do. Central Bank had been emphasizing on this fact year after year in its annual report. Uh, unfortunately, what has happened is the action that we had taken in the past uh, had been derailed midway by the politicians themselves. So as a result, when we had started reforming some of these enterprises, uh, what happened was that uh, until in, instead of taking them until we reached the final uh, uh, destination, uh, they were all stopped uh, midway to, and it has happened to all these enterprises there. So I hope uh, Minister Basil Rajapaksa is different from the rest of the uh, ministers of finance whom we had in the past and he will uh, be stick to this, you know, doing only the capital contribution and not the recurrent contribution. But uh, what I had noted in the past Ruin, is that uh, at the end of the year, when the accounts of these institutions are being audited, uh, Sujiva knows about this. Uh, they will qualify these uh, accounts and in order to avoid the qualification by the auditors, a letter of comfort is given by the treasury, uh, followed by the delivery of, um, say, uh, uh, some treasury bonds to the lending banks. So as a result, the lending banks had been, Bank of Seoul, People's Bank, which had been the main lenders to this issue, they had actually accumulated a large amount of treasury bonds, which does not pay any uh, interest to them, but uh, it will add to their balance sheet as an asset uh, owned by the government. So this is what is being done, because now this is where we have to take a cue from India. The Modi government had been so bold, and it has actually sold out the national flag carrier they are India to one of the groups. Similarly, there are lots of Sri Lankan companies, large companies in Sri Lanka which can take over our Sri Lankan airlines and they can run it uh, as a profitable venture. Uh, similarly, in the case of the CPC and CEB, of course, the uh, viability will come from uh, our own uh, freeze, uh, actually freeing the prices of these, uh, the, these, these institutions. Uh, to meet, match the market prices and for that purpose, previous government had a very wonderful thing called the pricing formula. Uh, this, this government had stopped it, but now the present government is, has introduced the same thing. So these are some of the things that you have to take into account and, uh, and uh, management of these companies will have to be handed down to people who knows the management. And uh, by doing that, 
and you may be able to come up with the, um, unfortunately the labor unions trade unions in sri lanka against that uh, we have a wrong you know mentality in us saying that we are selling out our national assets to outsiders uh, this kind of uh, mentality has to be stopped the government will have to go through a very serious uh, marketing campaign to, to promote it and uh, i hope mr rajapaksa would be successful in doing that uh, i hope uh, governor kabda will support it thank you dr vijayawardenan so yes 50 years and we hope this will be a change sujeev or shamen over to you uh, if you want to take up any questions from the chat and i think time is also now 920 so we may want to wind up in a little while yeah i i just want to ask uh, before we get sanjay uh, from uh, dilanka dilanka i know you have been looking for fabric mills in sri lanka you have been looking for fabric mills in africa and uh, and i know sanjay uh, is also doing a lot uh, in this in this space with the rahul uh, dedicated park how important uh, i mean uh, you as a large scale parallel exporter to some other uh, you know uh, well known global brands uh, dilanka how important is this uh, having, having a fabric mill at your sort of uh, at your disposal it's uh, it's become more important now than ever sujeeva um i mean for various reasons um again i'm you know refer a parallel here for on the importance of supply chain um after decades what this pandemic has done is that um uh, in the apparel retail space demand is more than supply and what this has resulted in is that retailers don't need to discount their inventory anymore to sell um because a lot of them are out of stock and you see majority of the brands who were unviable before the pandemic now reporting record profits i mean even the likes of marks and spencer uh, abercrombie and fitch you know the list goes on so this showed that if the brands actually hold the right inventory at the right time it's actually a very profitable model to operate on and to do that lead times become a very very important criteria so earlier we were fine because everybody was competing through price to factor in the discounts that the retailers would have to give you would always chase the cheapest needle or you'd always find the cheapest fabric source or the cheapest supply chain from you know the ends of the world right so you know you would import your fabric from china you might import your elastics from vietnam but now given the volatility in logistics given the lack of inventory over in the us uh speed has become a very important part and you can't be speed if you're going to leverage global supply chains to support you so having localized regionalized supply chain is like i said now important more than ever so i think what that there is a lot of potential and whilst eravur is extremely important it will take a couple of years given the nature of the industry to set up factories and have that yardage come out we're looking at maybe 12 to 24 months away but the need is now right so i think as a government as an industry as a country how we should do what we should do is really see how do we maximize the output of the existing infrastructure that we have because the thing with fdi and new investments is that whatever money that comes in and sri lanka has dollar in you know, a shortage of dollars it will first have to go out before the export proceeds come in right so if we can sweat the existing assets more that will be a quicker more efficient way of generating more export dollars so that is like uh, say for example if our factory is running on a single shift how do we incentivize how does the country incentivize to go double shift and if you're operating on a double shift how does the country incentivize someone to work on a triple shift so using the same asset you pretty much doubled or tripled your export revenue so i think we will have to look at a mix of policies of one maximizing your existing infrastructure and then two bringing in new investments and new plants uh, but a combination of this will have to be looked at together to really generate uh, more export revenues at least from a parallel standpoint thank you thank you uh, thank you mr articala for joining i know you have a hectic schedule today uh, thank you very much uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen we have mr sajita articala secretary of the treasury Uh, and secretary to the ministry of uh, finance uh, shamin you want to crack one or two uh, from uh, mr artigala where you want some clarification uh yes mr artigala thank you for joining us uh, there are actually quite a few questions uh on 
the social uh, contribution levy uh, that have been asked. So I'm glad you joined us. You can give us some clarity. One is uh, it's similar to the NBT. So in that sense, uh, is it going to be, uh, uh, it's, it's also called a COVID tax. Is it going to be temporary or, or is it more long term? How, how long would you expect to implement that tax, uh, Mr. Adikala? So, uh, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, sorry to get delayed, <laughs> right? Uh, the, uh, uh, this uh, social uh, tax or social uh, contribution, it's 2.5%. There's a small error in the technical notes. I don't know whether that has been corrected now. It says 3%, but it's 2.5%. Oh. Uh, I think uh, uh, we have to consider... Uh, it's like the NBT, as you are right there, because uh, uh, this will be on the top line, right? So, so the margins uh, we have to consider both those things also. So, so when the when the new tax <coughs> is implemented in April, uh, uh, those things will be taken into consideration. And and hope, yeah, we are. Uh, this is this this is uh, because I think you will agree. All will agree. The government has invested heavily in this uh, uh, for this COVID pandemic to 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 stop at least uh, uh, to uh, uh, in a way to curtail this uh, spreading etc. That is the vaccination program and so so I think all will agree and all will be willingly contributing to this because it <laughs> it it uh, yeah, it's a it's a win win situation in a way for all all of us. Uh, so, so uh, uh, that is about that. Uh, so, it's 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 presently yes, we are thinking it's these are all because I think in the last year budget also we mentioned this. Uh, in 2019, the government introduced a, a, a whole reform package in the tax structure simplification and things. So, and we have clearly mentioned the government has clearly mentioned that. We are not going to tinker this, or uh, the the continuity clarity would be there. So so, but then this COVID thing came in. So that's why I think the honourable minister has mentioned this will be one of taxes, right? Apart from the apart from the goods and services tax, things like liquor tobacco, the sin taxes and things. But these would be this would be uh, basically one of taxes. That that's good to hear, Mr. Atigala. Um, so I have just one more question all, also. All depends um, on the COVID. All depends on the <laughs> COVID. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Atigala, the GST, which was actually uh, one of the proposals that came up right. with the last budget, right. uh, yeah. has anything changed from the concept uh, that was uh, no. mentioned in the previous budget? No. It's no. to be a consolidation no. and yeah. not. Yeah, it's a consolidation, as mentioned earlier. Uh, uh, so the act is act in the sense the bill is ready so hopefully we can uh, go through the normal passage so there would be certain items that I think those were mentioned earlier that is the liquor tobacco uh, leisure uh, that is betting and gaming etc those would be there there's no change in the in the in the basket the the, the, the items that could be there uh, so it will be one composite tax like the special commodity levy that is applicable for dal etc so it's just one tax okay so it's not meant as a, a, a new revenue generating measure uh no now now say for an example it will it will make new it will bring new new revenue because now tonight we have increased the uh, the taxes on uh, liquor and tobacco that is coming under excise and excise special provisions act so 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 uh, that is so if if those rates are there in the new goods and services tax definitely from if you take today and tomorrow the numbers the rates have changed right so so that will bring that is the full year impact would come next year okay okay understood one one last uh, one question uh, mr adikala is uh, these new uh, new uh, taxes which are coming in are they deductible for tax purposes? Say the social security levy to the tax surcharge. 
No, I uh, <laughs> you what they need. To, <laughs> no, I don't think that these exclusions will be given, uh, Sujiva, uh, because as I mentioned, uh, uh, government on behalf of the whole country has invested on these things. So, so we have to maintain. You know this, right? So, your so people are talking about fiscal consolidation. Your people are talking about the expenditures high, and and people when you put some and and also also people talk about the taxes. We have to put more taxes, right? When you put something, you are ta talking about deducting it, right? <laughs> that is not. I don't know. That don't match, right? I think in lot of meetings, lot of places, people even in the parliament, people were saying the government has government has taken out the taxes. When you put something. Now the other side, so that is not correct. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> no, fair enough. No, fair enough. Uh, St. Uh, I mean, I don't know. We are. I mean, to be honest, uh, we are all saying that government revenues have to go up. I mean, it's, right. uh, there, there's no doubt on that. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Uh, and concessions given uh, during your uh, the sort of the secretary. I think I would love to see no more taxes, but given the circumstances, we had to do certain things, right? No, uh, absolutely. Uh, uh, St. One, uh, one last question before you move out. Uh, these uh, is that there is also uh, back again. We talk about the SOE restructuring, and we've talked about this over the. I'm sure during your entire career uh, at Central Bank and Ministry of Finance, every budget speech would have had something on SOE restructuring. Yeah, yeah. But the thing, thing is, no. I think I think uh, in this budget. Uh, there are a uh, lot of reforms, uh, I think, uh, not only the SOE side, right? But uh, just to just to elaborate a little bit, because I got this chance, right? Uh, if you don't mind, right? Yeah, please, please go ahead. Yeah. That is reforms, for reforms both in the private and uh, public sector. Uh, if you talk about the uh, private sector, uh, there are a uh, lot of reforms. Uh, that would be coming in, especially in the trade facilitation side. One is there would be a rating that would be done for the exporters. That would be if that rating would come from the chambers as well as the government. It will be a joint venture, I think. And and those exporters exporters will have. Uh, in a, in a very layman language, like green channel type of thing, right? So no questions asked, etc. But if you do naughty things, you'll be back in the red zones, right? Uh, <laughs> or black zone. Then, 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 then um, uh, the the other one is again. I think uh, for the importers and exporters, uh, you have to get uh, approvals from multiple agencies. If you take a quarantine thing, you have to go to quarantine standards, import export then to customs. So there are also we have uh, roughly about 1,766 line items would be uh, uh, this, uh, there would be a simplification in this, the, the, the main agency and then customs. There would be no other multiple agencies that would come in and also uh, uh, about 400 para tariff items will be removed. Those, that cassette is not yet out. But it will be out in the in the in the near future. So those uh, those are one one of the uh, or, or set of reforms for the trade facilitation side. And also we are pushing hard uh, for this uh, custom single window etc. More 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 uh, technology infusion. And I am determined to do that somehow. It has been talked again for a while. <laughs> right, I know. But uh, now uh, we are pushing hard for that. Uh, then, then about the uh, public sector side, I think uh, uh, one is the uh, pension reforms. Uh, uh, that is, we have extended the time, uh, the, the retirement age rather. Also, also in the procurement side, uh, we will be introducing a new procurement system for the government procurement because when, when if you if you see the numbers. In the budget, the public investment number will say huge number is there, but when finally uh, the, the, on the on the ground, it's not happening. One major issue is the these procurement delays. 
so what we want to do there is to try to bring this um, uh, it's accepted world bank uh, ndb type procurement system uh, and 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 uh, uh, fast track these act, uh, these activities that that could be a big reform in the public sector uh, uh, also also uh, uh, this uh, uh, this computer digital uh, infusion uh, in the government sector we are trying to move forward quickly there are this uh, one major item uh, is this uh, this what is this called uh, identity card thing like the social security card in the states so yeah. again again uh, it's it's now happening and hopefully 2022 we could see something happening there so we are pushing for that that would be a big reform it would be helping to uh, in a way rationalize certain uh, uh, recurrent expenditures also right especially the uh, duplication leakages etc in this social safety net that's one area also in the budget if you go through carefully we we have it, the whole budget it's there it is because you will you will understand that our country is more towards trading right so we are trying to push i think loads of uh, activities loads of proposals are there to push uh, to the manufacturing sector it's not just one night or you can't do it quickly but but uh, 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 mr jinadasa will accept that right so we have to we have to move towards that and 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 uh, uh, the uh, investments are articulated in the budget uh, also then then about the uh, support for vulnerable groups its targeted groups are there uh, i i think these will be not be dole outs like thing now for um, you know, three wheelers that again again affected by the pandemic these people are badly affected that the government has identified the school van people etc they have been support there that could be not the, not in cash grants they may be having loans where you can support them through those things leasing etc so that will have a in a way chain effect also in the system you know so so that type of activity could be done because i know uh, in in candy i mr amunugama the minister told me that they have they are trying to introduce something for this insurance for private bus owners where normally you have to pay the premium up front they are they want to do it staggered basis you pay x, x percentage up front the type of activities could be done in within this uh, these numbers right so that that's a targeted manner we have trying to we are trying to uh, impose or, or, or safeguard vulnerable groups also uh, the other major burning issue is about this uh, the price hikes uh, they are again uh, minister has mentioned about uh, selecting some uh, very vulnerable groups of the bottom end and trying to support them through uh, 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 what this call he calls sahana mall right so they are again it's like 50 percent from the from the domestic in the sense from that village if you can get the stuff and and some other stuff like say milk or, uh, uh, milk powder or something like that that pass would be like that so it's it's trying to uh, trying to uh, uh, integrate or uh, this the subsidies to the system itself you know uh, there would be certain imports but uh, that that is also one area uh, in the fiscal side uh, we are now given the co now if you take this year the deficit would be around 11% right <laughs> uh, so, so if you take out the covid expenses that would be around nine 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 and a half nine point seven so we want to <coughs> at least bring down <coughs> sorry uh, bring down this deficit by at least 250 basis points this year target is the or next year target is about 8.8 percent uh, so so uh, um, uh, and also minister and the government is very keen on certain expenditure controls as a symbolic measure i think he has mentioned about the pensions that the ministers right so that's from from to say that we are also ready because normally normally the 
the the what is this called the the, the people what they say is we if we if we manage 225 the whole country will be a, a heaven like thing <laughs> <laughs> so 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 at least uh, uh, that uh, he from that tent also they have done and and also we are very keen and when after after he, he became the minister he was very uh, keen on these um, uh, unnecessary non priority expenditures curtailing those things because you know in the government sector all like to do buildings right but we have enough space right uh, there are a lot of classic example that we we have stopped in this three four months uh, without uh, without uh, building new new things or uh, committing for certain things but the officers are working so there's no problem right so so those things will be there and 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 from the external side also uh, external that is the other area uh, uh, also there would be certain uh, there would be a finance act coming in to support the uh, exporters uh, uh, protect the exporters right so uh, uh, that that uh, f uh, that would be there because sometimes uh, uh, we may we may uh, in a way how to say that uh, we may uh, antagonizing or penalizing sometimes so so uh, we don't want that to happen uh, so we will try to uh, in a way uh, bring uh, in a happy happy ending we'll say <laughs> right so <laughs> things, uh, we'll try to do that uh, and 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 as i mentioned again uh, mostly moving from uh, these uh, trading to uh, ma manufacturing based thing that uh, that is starting from agriculture lot of lot of uh, things uh, in a in a way decentralized manner grassroots level thing uh, because in the in the evening meeting also the minister was telling uh, now definitely when you when you say each and every uh, gram sevaka division is getting x amount of money so people some can interpret that this will be a political thing right and 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 even for the decentralized budget uh, sujiva normally these uh, mps get uh, how much 10 million now is 15 million yes normally what they did earlier was they were distributing you know this uh, uh, wangedi etc those yeah. things, you know Ta and so, takarang, takarang sheets and takarang etc so <laughs> we have now today also they were blaming me also because uh, uh, we, I, we have issued a, a circular that it should be this these money should be used for projects right that has been in a way broad in a broader sense in the government uh, list th those should be used they may be small ones the road or the or the pipeline may be for two three houses but but that is okay right uh, uh, so but it should be in the within the broader framework of the government policies without without uh, just giving handouts which will be no use you know so so that that message he, he gave all the mps also uh, so so this uh, this will not be a, a political exercise so it should it should what we what we think it's a, it's a platform to to this uh, for the goal of uh, bringing up the manufacturing sector so there can be small small things happening then I the sector also where we can um, bring the country to a elevated position okay that's it thank yeah. you that's really useful uh before we uh, before we uh allow um starting to go uh, any questions from uh Dilanka as a as a large-scale exporter i know i mean you're doing 250 million dollars of exports only Dilanka has want... all the money here and <laughs> he's bringing all the money i know Dilanka, anything you want to clarify <laughs> Yeah, Dilanka. No, I mean, not I, I, more than clarify. I think it's to make a statement. I think, like Dr. Vijayvardhan said at the start, the finance minister this time has been dealt a very difficult set of cards. Um, so I, I understand the rationale that the central bank took on some of the recent circulars that were sent on mandatory conversions and things like that. And like the governor also mentioned, uh, it's important that. At least, you know, for the time being, we, we change hats and, you know, we have to look at it in a holistic manner from a country perspective. But it's also important that uh, 
this shared vision for the country is is uh, adopted and executed by all stakeholders so that we take this crisis that we're in and then as they say, you should never waste a good crisis to really bring in the reforms that you know that we've been supposedly talking about for about 50 plus years and this time really you know grab this opportunity to make those needed reforms and so that as a country we can prosper like you said uh, uh, you know it won't happen overnight but at least over the subsequent years we will get there and uh, i strongly believe that we can it's just we need to make hard decisions and make hard calls uh, unpopular decisions and and stick by them and give that consistency and drive to achieve that shared vision thank you thank you anything for uh, mr article before we uh, let him go shaman Ravini, anything quick one not from my center not from my side Sajir. Really? No. Uh, this time, no tax changes, no for her. Huh? No shaming? Yeah. Yes, my yeah. job is simpler this time. We start together. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Uh, uh, we, 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 yeah, we will try to keep you idling for another three, four years. Ah, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> But, but Mr. Artigala, that means that means for for professional firms like us, uh, you, you know, we, we have no work. Yeah, you also will have the same thing. <laughs> Sanjay, anything for Mr. Artigala uh, from uh, you as chairman of BOI? Uh, Sanjay is there. Yeah, Sanjay is there. Uh, no, I think one of the things that we talked about with uh, Mr. Artigala and we've been talking about with single window making a uh, trade facilitation. Do that. Uh, the aspects of uh, the uh, customs and all that, I think all those have come in place. I think that's quite a good. And I think the infrastructure and development will be always... About the free, free port uh, concept that we want to build Indeed, up. indeed, indeed. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, ST, the free port concept and really developing Sri Lanka as a hub in a really open way. And I think that's something that we've been, um, ST and uh, we've been pushing. And I think it's a, it's a, as I mentioned in the beginning, right? So I think... Uh, some of the issues that we've been fighting at institution level has been given a national uh, kind of a prominence, um, single windows, uh, in uh, streamlining certain things, uh, whether it is the uh, free port and the port concept, uh, building the right zones, uh, SMEs, and um, as well as large enterprises for the strategic businesses, uh, strategic verticals, and also taking the business out from uh, out from the city, right, where you don't have to compete for the talent pools, you don't have the other uh, issues around uh, uh, concentrated uh, industrialization we have seen around Kalutaruk and um, uh, Putlam, uh, Gampa and Colombo and move to Erabur, move to other places and get the SME sector also uh, up with the things. So I think there's a lot of those consistency coming in and the things that we've been ideating and discussing so I think it's a good thing and I think the important thing is also the uh, the changes in the Financial Act and how we provide uh, um, the consistent, um, the the frame for the investors and the exporters um, in a peace of mind. And but I think what very you very importantly talked about is where we should focus. And I think that perhaps could come in subsequently is versus tax breaks, where the rebate systems or where incentives can come in to really drive the value addition of the local exporters uh, and for value localization. And I think that is where we have continuously failed. Where more we put. Uh, certain guide rails, people will move into more the, on the tolling side where we further reduce our value capture in the country. And that's where, as a country, we need to make that pivot. And I think on the sectors that we have picked up, the backward in linkages and the integrations um, uh, that the budget try to achieve. And I think it's a, it's a good testament in terms of what both the foreign minister and the ST is pushing towards. So I think in that sense, it's quite in line in terms of how BOI looked at uh, in terms of where the country should head at and where we should put these deep roots. So good to see a lot of synchronization and I think uh, fingers crossed with the COVID behind us and hopefully not having another wave. Uh, meaning it all depends on how disciplined we all are going to be uh, come Christmas. But I think uh, um, that might um, give us a little bit of uh, tailwind to get the, to get the country a bit of breathing space next year. And then I think we need to get our physical, uh, um, the 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 dollar reserves up, and I think that's an important thing. Um, yeah, thanks. I mean, to, yeah. Thank you, Sanjay. Uh, is, uh, so last last question is uh, to uh, Mr. Artigala's good friend, uh, buddy and colleague. Is uh, Dr. Vijayadhan still on the call? He's gone. Right. Yes, Sajit. 
Yo, ah, yeah. right, okay. Nice to see you, yes. Yes, yes. Anything, uh, Mr. Vijayadhan, from, uh, Dr. Vijayadhan, from your team to congratulate him on doing the impossible in the present budget. And I hope that he'll be able to, you know, realize his targets. That's exactly yeah. what we, you know, expect of him to do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vijayadhana. All the best, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone uh, for joining. I know we are a few uh, minutes behind schedule. Uh, a, a big thank you to uh, uh, yeah, ST uh, for joining. I know he, he had other commitments as well. Same with Sanjay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay Odana. Uh, thank you, Dilanka, uh, for accepting our invitation. And also to Governor Cabral for joining us. And to my team at PwC, awesome team. Uh, very proud. Uh, Shaman, thank you for leading the effort. Uh, and uh, Ruvini for all the support given and to my uh, uh, team uh, behind the screens, to uh, Dylan, uh, Mifam, uh, and everyone else in the tax team, Rishani, Taranga, and, and everyone else. So uh, thank you for joining and uh, stay safe and I hope to see you again uh, next year. Thank you, everyone. Good night. All the best. Thanks. Good night. Good night.